the bulk of the scripture, so you can look it up if you're going to look, comes out of the book of Habakkuk. That's where most of it's going to come out of. Now, it's, it's kind of interesting. I, I like these kinds of things when you start looking. It's a Hebrew word. And uh, we pronounce it wrong even for saying it as a Hebrew word. Uh, looking it up and in the scriptures, they, they have this uh, letter that's bet, but it's also a vet, depending on where they put like little squiggles and stuff. And so when we say the name, it has one of those at the beginning. You know, we probably should have, I should have done this at the beginning before he's singing, you know, so we have voices are all clear. But it's a Oh, good. You're getting it over there. I hear that. All right. So, um, uh, it, it has that at the beginning, and then the B in Habakkuk is actually a V. So it, it's pronounced Chavakuk. All right, now you all got to try that, all right? So they go to it. So it's Chavakuk, all right? One, two, three. Chavakuk. Oh, there, you all speaking Hebrew, all right? And, uh, you know, go ahead and clean off whoever's next to you if you said that with an accent. So um, Habakkuk is... Uh, like some, he's referred to like as a minor prophet, but the only thing that makes a prophet in the Bible minor is that there's less writing that he's given. So there's no, that's something that uh, gets distinguished just as somebody's trying to organize the Bible. Um, he's a prophet, and I was trying to think of how do you explain like prophecy, at least from when I'm looking at it, what do we see? And um, one of the things that I thought of was a story when I was a kid. We used to have this like really cool sledding hill back when I was a kid. One, one part of the hill, it was like, this is the one I normally sled on. It was really smooth, but it was fast. If you got off, you know, normally if you didn't make it all the way down, you were hitting ditches and rocks and all that kind of thing. Down the middle, it was smooth. On the other side of the hill, there was one of these things that had like a double dip thing. And yeah, that was fun, but you only did that right at the end because that one really, most of the time you'd see people going down um, that sledding hill with the big inner tubes, and usually there's like 15 kids riding down and getting bounced off of it as it's going down this double hill. We would go over there towards the end of the sledding time because it was also a bigger trek to get up the hill. Well, this sledding hill, I don't know what happened. Sometime in the middle of the summer, we got thinking, me and a buddy of mine, let's take our bikes down this hill. That's going to be fun. Now, keep in mind, we're, we're not teenagers yet, so we, we're not... It, not that that would make it any better, but um, we're thinking, hey, let's go down this hill. We had this little training wheel bike. We called it a gator bike. I think that was the brand of it. It was a little, little blue bike for training wheels. The training wheels were off. That one seemed a little bit safer. And then we had the big boy's bike, you know, the one you get after that one. So the first hill, my friend goes down on the gator bike. We kind of have this deal. Then we'll switch bikes when we get to the bigger one. I take the big bike down it. We're like, that's exciting, you know. Woo! I got the feeling my friend wasn't so excited about the next hill. And he was like, kind of getting the idea that he wasn't going to go down the hill. That should have been my thought. But my thought was, if I go down that hill, that kind of makes him have to go down it. So that's going to be fun. You know, that, that's what I want to do. Now, keep in mind, I'm watching over the wintertime people going down that hill and getting bounced off of this inner tube going down just because there's all this jumps on it. Well, my friend's not, is like, ah, I don't think we should go down that hill. Let, let's go home. This is good. We, we had fun. Let's go down the hill. I'm like, no, that's you know, let, let's, go, let's go ahead and do this. Well, I have to go down it on the big kid bike because that was our deal. And I'm still thinking in my head, yeah, but then he'll have to go on the little bike. I don't know what I'm thinking, you know. And so I go down this. I, I, I can safely say I don't remember that trip very well because I did not make it down that hill. I'm not so sure I made it to the second lump. All I remember was standing there bleeding and just sitting there going to my friend going like, you want to go now, you know, like this. And I, I kind of think of, I tell the story because I think of like the prophets of God had my friend looking, like if, if God's talking and he's talking to this prophet of God, you should be getting this picture, a bloody kid there, don't go down that hill, you know, and that's God speaking there. And so it's that important when we're looking at prophets. I mean, I, 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 was, I, I was going for a walk and we're listening to modern day prophets and there's like a huge number there. They do all sorts of things, but I, I was listening to an interview going, okay, what, this guy did an interview. Let me listen to what he has to say. They even asked him, they said, um, so some of the things you predicted didn't come true. You know, what, what does that mean? And if God's talking, it always comes true. And all he said was, well, you just don't understand prophecy. And, you know, he was explaining it away. Now, these are big church leaders in our day-to-day. -day. This was the head guy when I think of 
prophetic groups. I mean, they did it right in that prophets, they're supposed to have more than one and they kind of keep track of each other. But you say no. And I'm like, so what is all this? What, how do we do this? The, the prophets serve a whole bunch of different purposes. One is to warn us, like in Nineveh, when the prophet went to Nineveh and he said, repent, and they all repented. Hallelujah. That's one mode of prophet that prophets do. Another prophet, um, there was a bunch of people talking to Paul when he was headed to Jerusalem. And they say, Paul, the Holy Spirit's telling us that if you go to Jerusalem, it's not going to go well for you. And Paul's response is, all right, guys, thank you. Uh, I'm going to Jerusalem now. And he, and he leaves. And it's like the Holy Spirit was telling him. There's not anything negative in the scripture about that. But then he leaves. And then he goes and he next stop before Jerusalem. There's a bunch of, I think they say four, sisters, four unmarried sisters is how they word it. They're prophesying. And then um, Agabus is a prophet of his day. He shows up and he takes a belt and he ties himself up. And he goes, the owner of this belt, if he goes to Jerusalem, he's, this is what's going to happen to him. Imprisonment, possible death, all of this. And it's Paul's belt. And Paul's response is, okay, guys, uh, thanks for that. I'm uh, headed to Jerusalem. And they're like, Paul, no. And they're weeping and they're crying. And Paul's response is, well, I'm going there because of Jesus. God's going to be glorified here. Don't stop that. And then he goes. So it's not the prophecy is supposed to warn him to not go but it is telling him what to expect. And maybe for the people there that were about to lose Paul, the prophecy also tells them, you know, get ready for this. Be prepared for that. Uh, we notice the promise of Messiah through prophecy. The end times we were talking about are prophesied. They're going to happen. You believe in the Bible, then you believe that it, they're prophesied all throughout the Bible, and then you have the book of Revelation, which is laying it all out. And that's what you see there. The prophets are um, speaking on God's behalf. They aren't wrong, but as listeners, we are supposed to test what they say. So that's what we see. Now, in Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas are telling with the Jew talking to the Jews in Antioch, and they're pointing out through Scripture, this is the prophecy coming true in Jesus Christ. The Messiah came. He's saying he died and he rose again. And everybody's getting excited about this as Paul's telling them that the prophecies are coming true. Now, some people may wonder, and this, kinda, this part of the story kind of clears it up for me when they say, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. That doesn't sound fair. What's that all about? But the Jews understood what was going on. They had God's word. They were following it. They were taught in it. So they understood when Paul was pointing out these prophecies that this is the Messiah. And this is how they concluded in verses 38 and 39. He says, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, referring to Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Now, what he's saying is that if you are following God, you're going to follow Jesus. You're going to follow the Messiah. That's, that's what's going on there. Because you, you have culture defining right and wrong. Okay? And that's why the Jewish people at that time might not be accepting Christ. Because they're just following the laws of Moses, believing that's going to be what saves them. And so he's saying, no, it's, it's bigger than that. You need to, if you're following God, you're also accepting Messiah. And... Um, what you would think about this is that works don't bring salvation. And so Paul is talking with the people saying, you know, follow Messiah. And then he concludes with this warning. He says, look, you scoffers. Or it says, beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish. For I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. And, I mean, this, this is a warning saying, look, for you people that aren't believing in what I'm telling you about Christ, he's referring to Habakkuk, a, a prophecy that Habakkuk made, and he's saying, I'm doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. He's not referring to Christ right there, that work that you're not understanding. It's the warning he's referring to. And uh, after he said this warning to them, they liked what he said, and they invited them all back the next Sabbath. 
said, hey, that was good news. Let's hear it. It says in Acts that pretty much the whole town showed up right after that. And, uh, <laughs> and when the whole town showed up, some of the Jews got jealous and some of the Jewish leaders going, man, he's got a following. So they started contradicting him and then he came into problems. But Paul is quoting Habakkuk to the people in Antioch. And so we're thinking, all right, we've got this prophecy that was definitely to Judah. Now Paul's applying it to Antioch. And I'd say that in this sermon, I'm going to apply it to us today as far as something for us to look at and think about this prophecy that was made through Scripture. Now, this time period in Habakkuk's prophecy is the time before Nebuchadnezzar, he's like in the, the last of the wicked kings. The Tanakh says it's during the time of King Manasseh, and there's like a few kings left, and then Babylon's going to come in and wipe them all out. Okay? And, and that's when this prophecy is going on. And so we're wondering, how, why is he making a prophecy about that to Antioch? And the prophecy is tied when Paul's saying it. He's saying, if you don't follow God, as it's shown in the scriptures that Jesus is the Son of God, so you're following him, then what happened then is going to happen to you now. So he's applying the situation of God's judgment from Habakkuk's time, when, how they were believing and behaving, to uh, the people in Antioch. And again, you know, it's kind of like he understood his what he was saying needed to be tested. And so he's referring back to this scripture in Habakkuk. Um, Habakkuk is an intriguing prophecy because if you go to Habakkuk, he's, it's actually, it's not um, him preaching to Judah. It's him having a conversation with God. It's really an interesting prophecy to take a look at. Habakkuk, the, the way the conversation goes is Habakkuk talks, God talks, Habakkuk talks, God talks, Habakkuk comes to a realization, he has his conclusion. And what Habakkuk is asking is, and we've asked this question too, why does God allow wickedness, especially if he's good? We have a holy God, why does he allow wickedness? The Jewish people are not following God, and that's what uh, Paul's referring to. At this time, you have a lot of wickedness going on, and the Jewish people are not following God. They are getting involved in other things. They said it's God. The law is paralyzed. So they're not following God's law. Justice is being perverted. That's what um, Habakkuk is saying in his section of this conversation. And he's saying, why? And Paul's tying what's going on is that we've got people not following God. If you're not following God, you're not on the good side of this equation here. So if you don't accept Messiah, then what are you following? Anyway, he moves on. And in our time, the Bible is starting to be seen kind of as outdated. I mean, think about the stuff that is accepted in churches. I mean, uh, the, the stuff they're preaching, I, I probably referred to this once before. My mom was telling me how she went to a church, and it wasn't her church. She was visiting, and the pastor gets up, you know, and opens a beer and sits down and just being all welcoming to everybody, like totally profaning what's going on in front. Now, it's the stuff, what's worse is what's preached. Like things like uh, premarital sex is not seen as a bad thing. I mean, think of our culture. What do we um, accept in what we see? Things that are labeled as sin, we call sickness. Things like, um, I don't know, we say uh, becoming a drunkard is being an alcoholic, that you're just sick and you need help. It's not sin. There's no hope in that. And the law is being paralyzed. And that's what um, Habakkuk is t talking about in his first section. Well, what we say is right and wrong is being changed. Even just things like God created male and female is being challenged. And our culture is changed. So some of it is to wonder as us personally, what has our culture taught us? We need to go back to the Bible. That's what it all comes down to. Every sermon anybody should ever preach is say, go back to the Bible. You should be testing those sermons by going back to the Bible. And so um, I guess I have a question here. The, the thing is that it comes down to is when people start questioning, they say, is that what God really said? And you probably heard that phrase before. That's what um, Satan was talking to Eve in the garden that started all this thing. Is, is that what God really said? And we have all this hurt. And this is what Habakkuk is asking. All this falseness. 
how does God allow, why does God allow it? Habakkuk is looking for a revival and the repentance of Judah. Ever since I've been a kid, that's what one thing is like, we need a revival. And um, so he's going to God and saying, God, let, let's get this. Why do wicked prosper? We need you. Come and take care of it. Time for a revival. And then God answers, and we see that in uh, Habakkuk. And he, God's responding to Habakkuk's plea when he's crying out to God in verse 5. He says, Look among the nations and see wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. I'm going to get a little bit farther, but I want to note that, that this is what Paul was quoting right here. That's the scripture that we saw. He's referring to this. And what's God's answer? Time for revival in the land? He says, no, I'm bringing the Chaldeans in. These are the Babylonians. These guys are wicked and bad, and I'm bringing them in to wipe you out. Let's keep reading this section here. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff. And at rulers, they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. Now, quite frankly, this is not what Habakkuk was expecting. I mean, it, it says, I, I could just imagine Habakkuk saying, God, we need revival, come in. And he says, I'm going to take this other nation, raise up this wicked, horrible, horrible people and come wipe you out. And Habakkuk's like, um, that's not quite God. Uh, God, are you sure? Um, his very first thing in his response is, he's like, uh, God, he starts listing the things he knows about God. Okay, God, you're everlasting. He makes sure he puts in there that um, he says, we shall not die, meaning we have this covenant with God, so we know we have that. And, but he doesn't understand because he's saying, God, the people you just described worship themselves. They are way worse than we are. They're wi they, they do wicked professionally. They're bad people compared to us. And they're going to come in and wipe us out? They're worse than us, God. And he wants, he, he's waiting for an answer. He says he's like a watchman on a wall waiting for the answer. And so God's going to respond to him again. And this is, starts in... Uh, verses 2, 2 through 4 is when God responds to this thing, like, these guys are more wicked. What are you thinking, God? And he says, And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that he, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it, it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. So what he's saying, he's comparing two types of people here. He says, in my time, these guys are going to get it. He's comparing two types of people. He's preparing the people who are not righteous and the people that live by faith. Now, a lot of times in a prophecy like this, it's for the nation of Judah. Okay, this is, um, the northern tribes have already been taken by Assyria. This is a few years before um, Babylon is going to come and wipe them out. And it hasn't happened yet. And he's saying there's two types of people. There's those who live by faith, and there's those who um, are the not righteous people. And then we tend to say, okay, we're in, let's apply it to ourselves here. We're in America. We can see, dang, this is the thing that's going to happen to people who aren't following God, this is a pretty big deal. Now, understand Habakkuk is saying this is going to happen to all of Judah, not just a few people. He's going to come in and wipe out everybody. He's saying, you know, we were wondering why the wicked are prospering, and this is what you're going to say to me here. But we need to think that this, this verse here where you're saying, 
And behold, his soul is puffed up, meaning Nebuchadnezzar, and it's not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. That individualizes this to us because it's saying, do, are you living by faith? Faith in what? Faith in this God that said we won't die, in this God that we honor even in this bad time. And he's saying, uh, I just got lost here. He's saying it, the circumstances that you're in isn't what matters. It's that faith that you're having. The horrible time that you're in, I'm going to send something even worse, and you don't know why I'm doing that, mind you. And then you live by faith. God's answer about uh, wicked Judah is mainly seen about um, an even worse Babylon. And he goes on. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. Now, just to explain that, basically, he's, God's talking about Babylon now. He's answering why do the wicked do this. That wine that's a traitor, he's saying Babylon is like a guy who's drunk, and that's where he's getting his confidence. There's no reason for it. It's just based off of him. An arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death, he has never, he, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. So he's a really bad guy, really bad people, and they're going to come in. He's saying that's what's going to happen. Shall not these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? So he's answering. He's saying, these wicked people coming in, they're going to get theirs. And loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble? Meaning the people that you are subjugating are going to turn it around on you because you're so evil. Then you will be spoiled for them because you have plundered many nations. All the remnant of the peoples shall plunder you. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You have forfeited your life, for the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the woodwork respond. So even the things that you build, you think you're above everything, it's still going to come down on you. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts that people labor merely for fire, and nations weary themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now this is the key to what we're seeing here. What's the key to this prophecy? God is going to be glorified. I mean, they think, I was trying to think, oh, okay, what's this water is covering the sea? Oh, maybe it's like all that snow we got the other day. No, not quite, because we were still inside and the snow wasn't covering us. God's going to be glorified like water on the sea. Picture that one. God will be glorified. With all these evil people, woe to them. I raised them up. I'm going to bring them down. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup of the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon, which is a poetic name for Israel, will overwhelm you as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified him. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities, and all who dwell in them. So, whatever comfort here, I'm still not saying we answered the question about why does God allow the evil, but the comfort is God will not allow evil, and these evil people that came in and wiped them out will be punished for it. God can't stand evil. Just as uh, Habakkuk was saying at the beginning, why, Lord, why are you allowing this evil? God's answer is, I don't. And then he says, look, look at who these people that you are seeing is so powerful put their faith in. See that in verse uh, 18 and 19. What prophet is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies, for its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. 
Let all the earth keep silence before him. So we're, God's just basically saying, all right, I understand. The Chaldeans are bad, but they put their faith in themselves. They put their faith in idols. It's not a real thing. I am real. So he's putting it on the line here. Put your faith in God or not. This is what Paul was referring to Antioch. This warning that bad things are coming. And he's saying, like when we talk about the end times, bad things are coming. And the answer is to put your faith in God. God tells Habakkuk that the um, Chaldeans are going to pay for it. Okay, now we go back to the beginning here, and it's like Habakkuk still doesn't understand. But he says in verses 3, it, it's kind of a song. So when you see uh, some stuff at the end, I, I think that some of these uh, terms at the beginning and at the end are just designated for music stuff. But it's a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shingenaroth. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So his first response is, I still don't understand. I still don't get it. But then he praises God right at the start. He's saying, Lord, I have heard of you. I, I fear of you. And then in the, in the bo most of what he says in his reply is he's going over all the wonderful things God has done. I can tell you, when I've been in places where I'm wondering, God, why? The thing that really I, I understand what Habakkuk is doing here, he starts listing what has God done before, what has God done since, even though I don't understand what's going on at this time. So even though there's wickedness that's abounding, even though things are getting worse and God's not going to allow that to happen. He's doing a thing we don't even know and we wouldn't even understand if he was going to tell us and it's going to come through and God's going to have his way. That's a prophecy that Paul is telling to Antioch. Well, then he starts talking about um, all the things that God has done. Then he gets to verse 16 where he admits as he's afraid and he doesn't understand it. He says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. So he said, I understand God's judgment. I understand things are going to happen. I'm going to put my faith in God. Now, you keep in mind, he's talking about the people that didn't followed lawlessness. And that's what he said. The law, the wicked people made it so that the law was, justice was perverted. The law wasn't followed. So what are you doing if you're following God? You're following what God, God wants you to do. Well, then he ends up finishing um, in verse 17 through 19, um, where he says this, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the st stalls. So he's acknowledging there's calamity. And then he says this, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. So he's saying, why, why he doesn't understand? He said, but God's in control. And that's what I'm going to put my faith in is God is in control. It gets, it's hard to do. More than we put, um, it, it's more than that. It's like we put our faith in God because he's good. And he is our salvation. And he's not going to let us down. When life seems out of control and it seems like evil is winning and you're going, look, God, this has happened to me and all those evil people are doing great. I'm not pointing at anybody, sorry. Uh, that everybody's doing, gr I'm still not pointing at anybody, I'm making eye contact, sorry guys, I'm not meaning anything by it. But even though that there's evil abounding, the strength and righteousness comes from God. 
It's way too easy to start letting culture tell us things are right and wrong, and then we become part of the problem, and then when hard times hit, we're in a bad way. And one thing that I like to just point out as I end this is Habakkuk means the one who embraces. It's saying that even though all of this stuff happens, he embraced God. That's not from me. That's what somebody else had said. I thought that was kind of an interesting idea that in the hard times, we've got to be thinking about our own faith and how we are going to follow God. Even though there's judgment to all of Judah, but we're all a part of that in what we follow. And as we were talking about the end times earlier on, it's coming. And the Chaldeans may not be Babylon, but that will be probably our code name for it when we're talking about them. I mean, there's a lot coming, and we need to put our faith in God. All right, let me close with prayer there. Heavenly Father, uh, prophecy sometimes is just kind of mind-boggling in how it applies to us, and how do we test it to know if it comes from God or not, from you or not. Lord, we just pray as we study and learn as things happen and as we interpret the evil world around us that we are praying for discernment and that we're reading our bibles and finding what you what pleases you in the way we can live our lives and lord we thank you that we can have this joy that habakkuk is referring to and praise your name no matter what's going on and we thank you and we ask for your continued blessings in yeshua's name Amen.